Hello, thank you for joining us. We'll be just waiting uh, about a few more seconds, maybe just under a minute for more uh, as attendees are joining us. All right, hello, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for the 2021 UN South Asia Forum on Business and Human Rights. This is the session, as you see, titled International Investment Agreements, Human Rights and Sustainable Development. I'm Dory from Q Design, and I'm your technical facilitator today. Uh, just, to no just to note, the chat is disabled for this session, so please send any questions for the speakers through the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you require any support for uh, Zoom or technical assistance, also feel free to send a message through the Q&A box or raise your hand. Please note that the session today is being recorded. I will now hand the floor over to Surya. Thank you very much, Dori. Hello, everyone, from wherever you are joining. Uh, my name is Surya Dev. I am the current vice chair of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. And it's my great pleasure to moderate this discussion uh, with a distinguished panel of experts. Uh, before I introduce uh, the panelists, let me briefly mention the context within which the session is taking place. International investment agreements, human rights, and sustainable development, in my view, are three islands that are being forced to converge. If you look at the historical context, international investment and human rights were something that in 1970s onwards, there was a plan at the UN level to merge them together in terms of rights of investors, but at the same time, responsibilities of investors. But then this code of conduct could not be adopted and there was this decoupling in which the investment agreements evolved without any responsibilities of investors in those agreements. And of course, international human rights law evolved separately and it hardly imposed any responsibilities on investors or businesses as such directly. Now, of course, uh, things are changing in the last one decade or so in particular. And the session is going to discuss this more in the context of what is happening in South Asia. The working group is also writing a report uh, and that will be presented to the UN General Assembly uh, later this year. So this session is also going to feed into that particular report. Now there are many issues uh, in the intersection of uh, investment agreements and human rights. Uh, one issue of course about policy coherence, uh, then issues about space, uh, regulatory space that the states have under those investment agreements. Uh, should investors have human rights responsibilities or hard obligations under these agreements? And of course, uh, the controversial question about ISDS. Uh, do we reform it? Is it balanced? Or what do we need to do with it, right? So those are the questions uh, that the panelists are going to address. So let me now quickly introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, so we have uh, with us uh, Mr. Jörg Weber, who is the head of the investment policy branch at UNCTAD. Uh, thank you, Jörg, for joining this session. The second speaker is Mr. Prabhash Ranjan, who is a senior assistant professor at the Faculty of Law Legal Studies at the South Asian University based in New Delhi. Thanks, Prabhash, uh, for joining. The third speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Delini uh, Paterana, and she is the senior lecturer at the Faculty of Law University of Colombo. Uh, Delini, thank you uh, for joining this panel. Uh, the fourth speaker is uh, Mr. Anish uh, Bastola. He's, he's a senior associate in the Newpan Law as, uh, Associates, a law firm in Kathmandu, I understand. Uh, 
Last but not least, we have Sania Reed Smith. She is a legal advisor and senior researcher at the Third World Network. So thanks, Sania, for joining this uh, session. So the format of this uh, session will be that uh, all the panelists will have a uh, first round of interventions. And I'm going to pose each one of them a couple of broad questions that they will try to address. And then we uh, have a discussion also based on the questions that uh, some of the participants may pose or, or the questions that I may ask them. So without any further ado, let me start with Jörg. So Jörg, if you can uh, highlight with us what key recommendations UNCTAD has made uh, in terms of uh, how states can uh, negotiate more human rights friendly or pro sustainable development investment agreements or how could they reform the existing agreements in those lines and if you can also highlight what has been the uptake of those recommendations in particular in south asia the floor is yours Jörg. thank you thank you very much thank you very much good uh, good afternoon uh, good morning everyone it's a great pleasure to be with you. I will. Uh, I have prepared a, a PowerPoint which I will share with you. Didunk. Here we go. No, here we go. Yeah. Okay. Especially a great pleasure to be with uh, um, you today. Come on, slideshow. Here we go. Good. Good morning and good afternoon again to all of you. What I would like to do is uh, to start out with uh, as a as a bit of a background. Uh, what we're talking about, namely. Uh, looking at the current IRA situation in uh, South Asia. To so this, uh, we count uh, uh, altogether nine countries, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Iran, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Together, these countries by the end of 2020 were part to 190 bilateral investment treaties, of which 145 uh, are in force. Uh, so have been enacted in national laws. Only seven of these uh, uh, bilateral investment treaties are intra-Asian, uh, intra-South Asian bits. And uh, interestingly, 87% 80, of these bits were signed over 10 years ago, which is an important point to make, as we will see later. Uh, references to uh, human rights in these agreements is extremely rare. Actually, there is only one notable exception, which is the recent bits are concluded by India, with Brazil, Kyrgyzstan, and Belarus all based on the 2015 model BIT of India, which includes a reference to the human rights in the corporate social responsibility provision. Likewise, in all of these treaties, in these 190 treaties, references to uh, corporate social responsibility as such is extremely rare. There's the notable exception of the Iran-Slovakia Slovakia bilateral investment treaty of 2016. So from the perspective of reflecting the issue of human rights in in uh, South Asian IRAs, uh, quite uh, a bridge uh, far to go. Um, the same holds true for the uh, South Asian regional agreements, uh, in particular SAFTA and BIMSTEC. Uh, none of them are having uh, uh, any human rights provision. They have only limited investment provisions in the first place, and those uh, do not deal uh, with uh, uh, human rights. The same holds true for the ASEAN India Investment Agreement of 2014 zero reference to human rights. There is, however, the recently adopted UNCTAD D8 uh, joint guiding principles for investment policy making adopted in 2020. As you see, this includes uh, uh, Bangladesh, Iran, and Pakistan, and they are geared towards promoting inclusive economic growth and sustainable development in principle nine, referring to corporate governance and responsibility, thus recognizing the increasing importance of, of these two issues for international and national investment policy making, including by reference in the guidance uh, to several intergovernmental organization standards deriving from the United Nations, the ILO, the IFC and the OECD, providing guidance uh, for on fundamental CSR issues, including of course, uh, human rights. Now, as indicated above, some 76% of the South Asian countries IRAs are enforced. And it's on these uh, enforced treaties that up until the end of uh, 2020, uh, some alleged violations of these treaties brought about uh, uh, some 43 known cases of investor state dispute settlement involving South Asian countries. Uh, most of them lodged against India, uh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Uh, 
Uh, out of these, uh, 27 cases have been decided, 16 are still pending. And if we look at uh, how these decisions uh, were made, 11 of them uh, were settled. Uh, we don't know in most cases what exactly the content of the settlement agreement was. But if we look at the ones which reached the decision, seven were decided in favor of the state and six were decided in favor of the investor. Now, as I alluded to earlier, almost all of these uh, known treaty cases, uh, ISDS cases, are based on treaties that were concluded before the year 2020. And the same was true for these uh, uh, cases, uh, 43 known cases uh, from involving South Asian countries. And it's notable that the treaties which were concluded before 2010 mostly contain very broad and vague formulations. And these broad and vague formulations have enabled investors to challenge core domestic policy decisions, for instance, regarding the environment, financial regulations, energy, and public health. They have also generated unanticipated and at times inconsistent arbitral interpretations of core IRA obligations, resulting in a lack of predictability as to the kinds of state measures that might violate or might not violate a specific IRA provision. As a result of that, today there is a broadly shared view among almost all states uh, uh, around the world that treaty provisions need to be clearer and more detailed and drafted on the basis of a thorough legal anal analysis of their actual and potential implications. And that the current system of settling investment disputes as it exists today needs to be reformed. Now, recent treaty drafting has taken this into account. Uh, and we can see that new treaties, as I said uh, before, uh, those uh, tend to be concluded after 2010 are much more sophisticated in their formulations and have uh, yet to give rise to the uh, unfolding of investor state dispute settlement cases uh, on, on, on their provisions because precisely of the clarity they provided and precisely also because of the, of the provisions for exceptions to public policy making that cannot be challenged on the basis of an IIA. Now, this is important today, especially today, because, of course, as we all know, we're all working from home. The COVID-19 pandemic has uh, uh, brought about uh, uh, quite a number of uh, state measures. And the question now uh, arises uh, uh, that this once again underlines the urgency of balancing regulatory freedoms and investor protection in IIAs as well. We know already of uh, two publicly known threats of arbitration against uh, two Latin American countries, namely Peru and Chile, for measures that they take, uh, have taken in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, in this case relating, I think, to airport and highway operations. But if you look at all the uh, state measures taken by countries around the world, you can uh, easily uh, uh, see that several of them are challengeable from the perspective of that they uh, are, are, can be can be used, can be seen as uh, uh, infringing on the profitability of investor operations and therefore violating uh, uh, unclear and uh, vastly broadly formulated uh, uh, investor protection provisions, uh, such as a very open ended, fair and equitable treatment standard. Now, to accelerate uh, the IRA reform, the reform of these existing stock of uh, old generation treaties, we have uh, in 2020 released our IRA reform accelerator to help expedite the modernization of this existing stock of the old generation. I think we count 2,500 old generation IRA treaties in force. The IRA accelerator's response to the need for changing the substantive aspects of the IRA regime by focusing on a selection of reform oriented formulations for eight key IIA clauses, including, as I've mentioned, in particular, the fair and equitable treatment clauses and the indirect expropriation provision. For each of these, the IIA reform accelerator identifies ready to use model language based on recent IIA and model BIT examples. It builds on Amtat's investment policy framework uh, and provides a tool for coordination, focused discussion, and indeed consensus building on joint reform actions between multiple countries. It can be used for joint interpretation, amendment, or replacement of all treaty provisions. IIA reform has made significant progress, consolidating the phase one, namely the development of modern IIA reforms. Now, most new treaties contain uh, elements which were identified in uh, UNCTAD's roadmap for IIA reform, uh, which set out reform actions in five key areas, namely for safeguarding the right to regulate while providing protection, reforming investment dispute settlement and promoting and facilitating investment as well as ensuring responsible investment and enhancing systemic consistency. 
It is now high time to move on to phase two of the IRA reform, modernizing, modernizing the existing stock of old generation IRAs. For this, Antat presented a reform uh, map for the phase two with 10 policy options listed here in the, in the chart, uh, which countries can adopt and uh, adapt to pursue their IRA reforms in line with their policy priorities. The accelerator, which we launched last year, can be used for the three highlighted reform actions, namely jointly interpreting uh, treaty provisions, amending treaty provisions, and replacing outdated treaties. As a way forward, countries need to prioritize their reform actions, identify the right treaty partners to implement reform, and ensure policy coherence when moving ahead. ANCTAD stands ready to perform, support these reform efforts globally as well as in the region. And so in the last slide, let me just quickly point out that we have indeed provided technical assistance and worked hand in hand with India and Pakistan and Nepal on both phase one and two reforms and that we stand ready to also engage with the other countries in the region to move all of this forward. Uh, with regards to the human rights uh, element, as I said at the beginning, we are at the ascendancy of reflecting human rights provisions in IRAs in the region, India being at the forefront of this development. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, uh, all of your participants' uh, uh, interventions with regards to where we stand, uh, with regards to this view in the other countries of the, of the sub-region and what the next steps can be to, to move this forward. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jörg. Uh, that was excellent uh, background uh, for everyone so that we know the numbers, the data, and, and the progress that uh, your slides show, how things are evolving, in particular in South Asia. I think that that's very useful. Thank you very much for that. So uh, may I suggest uh, we do uh, a poll question at this particular point of time. I'm going to, so, so all, all the attendees and the panelists can uh, participate in this poll. Uh, the poll is anonymous, so please feel free to uh, jump in and uh, participate. And we're going to share the uh, result of this poll, which uh, hopefully uh, the speakers may take into account when they, when they provide their reflections. So let me now bring in the second speaker. So Prabhash, uh, the question that I have for you is, you have been writing extensively about uh, the bilateral investment agreements about India, uh, how India is evolving its uh, model bilateral investment agreement or actual uh, investment treaties. And you have critiqued it uh, extensively on that. So, so, so my question to you is, uh, what is your reflection in terms of how Indian government is moving in relation to the investment agreements in terms of striking a balance between protecting the investors' rights as well as safeguarding the policy space. Is that balance right in your judgment? Is a balance possible at all? And uh, what is the best way for the Indian government to reform its old uh, bilateral investment agreements? Because as York highlighted, it is the real difficulty, it seems, is with the old investment agreements, which, which are very, very one-sided. So with these, uh, I give the floor to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prabhash, for joining. Floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Surya. I'm very happy to be part of this discussion, and I'm extremely grateful to you for this kind invitation and for the opportunity. Uh, to answer your question, I think, the Indian government has tried to strike a balance between investment protection and states' right to regulate. Uh, let me sort of uh, upfront say that in my view, this balance has not been properly struck in the sense that uh, if we look at India's initial bilateral investment treaties or the first generation investment treaties that India signed uh, in the 1990s and early 2000s, these investment treaties contained extremely broad and vague provisions uh, and they, uh, they kind of provided too many assurances and protection to the foreign investor and did not contain anything as regards protecting the host state's right to regulate his concern. Uh, then India was, India was sued by a large number of investors and India decided because of this to revisit its BITs. Uh, and as part of this, it came up with a new model investment treaty in late 2015, early 2016 where it claimed that it has tried to strike a balance. Uh, and I will, and I, I will very briefly tell you how it, how it has tried to strike a balance, especially in terms of trying to provide regulatory autonomy for 
taking steps for protection of environment and other things. Uh, but in my view, uh, this, this balance has not been struck because it now goes to the other extreme whereby it does not provide adequate protection to foreign investment. So I'll give you, I'll give you sort of three examples to demonstrate where Indian model BIT and the subsequent BITs that India has signed post the model with countries such as Belarus, Kyrgyzstan, etc., uh, which is almost a replica of the Indian model BIT. Uh, there are three levels at which India has, uh, has, has sort of provided, has, has contains provisions for, for protecting environment and human rights. Uh, the first is that all these BITs contain a general exception clause, Article 32, uh, which states that uh, the host state may adopt measures which are necessary for the protection of environment, which are necessary for the protection of public health, etc. Uh, then the second level at which this balance has been attempted to be struck is in the form of investor obligations. This is contained in Article 11 and Article 12. Uh, of the model BIT. The Article 11 talks about compliance with domestic laws and it imposes an obligation on all the foreign investors to comply with the host country's laws when they undertake, the, when they undertake their investment. Uh, and Article 12 is about corporate social responsibility, uh, which has a reference to human rights as was pointed out earlier. Uh, but both these provisions exist in the form of a best endeavor clause uh, or, or they are a soft law instrument they do not impose binding obligations on the foreign investor. Uh, and therefore, while they are a step forward from the first generation investment treaties, because the first generation investment treaties did not contain anything on investor obligations. So seen from that standpoint, this is definitely a step forward, but it does not impose binding obligations on the foreign investor. Uh, and therefore, uh, using this kind of language, it may not be possible in an ISDS claim to hold the foreign investors accountable. Uh, and therefore, uh, in my view, if indeed India wants to strike a balance, then, this, then the way forward could be to impose binding obligations uh, on foreign investors as regards uh, human rights or environmental protection, etc. Uh, the third level at which India has tried to strike a balance is by introducing provisions in specific uh, uh, substantive standards which provides space for protection of environment uh, and other, other regulatory objectives. For example, Article 5.5 in the expropriation provision clearly states that if the state has adopted a regulatory measure which is legitimate and for the protection of uh, public interests such as environment, et cetera, then such a measure cannot be, cannot be held to be expropriation of foreign investment. So this is an example of a measure which is specific to one substantive standard which tries to balance uh, environment protection or other regulatory objectives along with investment protection. Uh, the reason why I say that this balance in, in, in the new model BIT is tilted towards, invest, towards uh, host states' right to regulate uh, is because the substantive rights which are available to investors have been reduced in the model BIT. For example, there is no MFN provision. Uh, while, while the concern is that MFN provision has been very broadly interpreted, allowing the investors to borrow beneficial provisions from third country BITs, this concern could have been addressed by redrafting the MFN provision in a narrower fashion, rather than doing away with the MFN provision. Uh, likewise, the ISDS provision has been, has been severely diluted, uh, and it is subject to a large number of conditions which the investor has to meet before the investor can submit a claim to an international arbitration. Uh, so, in nutshell, what I would say, what I would say is that if you know, in 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 my reckoning, the way forward should be as follows: that you provide all the rights to the investors as far as uh, ensuring that the state's arbitrary conduct can be challenged by the investor before an arbitration forum. But at the same time, you also ensure that investors are held accountable. Uh, for any human rights breaches or for not honoring environmental obligations, etc., uh, which can be done if the state uh, if the state ensures that there are binding obligations imposed on the foreign investor in the treaty itself. So, on the one hand, you you should have investment protection provisions available, and on the other hand, you should have provis provisions which provide regulatory autonomy to the state uh, and impose obligations on the investor. So in, in my view, this balance is possible, uh, provided the states do not want to 
uh, shy away from being held accountable under international law uh, for any arbitrary conduct. And at the same time, the investor should be held accountable if they indeed uh, undertake their investment activities, which is in blatant violation of environmental norms or other human rights norms. So uh, I'll stop here and uh, we can discuss this further after we have heard all the panelists. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Prabhash, uh, for uh, highlighting this nuanced uh, analysis of the Indian uh, situation, how it has evolved. So on the one hand, you see that there has been an evolution, but it also seems that that evolution is benefiting mostly the state and its power to regulate. Uh, that evolution is not benefiting the, the affected communities, for instance, because it does not impose hard obligations. So you would like the balance uh, to be going in a different direction slightly. Uh, so I think that is what I understand from your intervention. So, so thank you very much for that. Uh, so we also have uh, a result of the poll. Uh, and it's interesting. Uh, uh response because a significant majority are saying that there should be binding humanist obligations and i think uh, prabhash also somehow suggested that right because the soft standards are not useful that much they're doing a lip service uh so i think perhaps those things are there but of course th there are some people who suggested that soft uh, norms may be better so that is something also who the subsequent speakers may take into account. So let me now turn on to the next speaker. This is uh, Delini. So Delini, uh, if I may invite you now to share the perspective from Sri Lanka. So what has been the uh, position of the Sri Lankan government in relation to investment agreements, uh, in particular, how these uh, investment agreements are contributing or could contribute to achieving sustainable and inclusive development in Sri Lanka. And, and of course, uh, I would like to hear from you in terms of the trend that you see or some internal discussion, if you are aware of any, that where Sri Lanka would like to go in terms of uh, imposing, of course, they want to attract investment uh, and the protection of investors' rights is key for that. At the same time, how do you strike a balance? So similar to the, the analysis uh, provided by Prabhas. So floor is yours, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Shura, and uh, thank you for inviting for me this uh, session. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Not yet? Mm, not yet. Uh... Okay. Yeah, we can see something happening now. Yeah, we can see a screen now. Thank you. Probably you can do it in the uh, slideshow mode. Yeah, slideshow. Yes. Thank you I so think much. Right there. Thank you very much. My presentation mainly focuses on Sri Lanka's interaction with the contemporary investment treaty regime. It aims to provide some insights into why and how Sri Lanka should change her conventional approach towards investment treaties while observing the country's stance on imposing obligation on foreign investors, mainly in the area of human rights. Before discussing the way forward for Sri Lanka, let me quickly uh, reflect upon the reform agenda for international investment law or the multifaceted recalibrating process taking place in the current global investment regime. One aspect of this regime, the process, focuses on making investment dispute settlement mechanism more legitimate, transparent, and participatory. In contrast, the other aspect uh, tries to ensure that investment treaties are well-drafted agreements with the necessary provisions to safeguard the state right to regulate in the public interest. In terms of the policy, there is an urgency to ensure that foreign investment will drive sustainable and inclusive development instead of mere economic growth of the countries that host them. More importantly, the discourse on the obligation of the foreign investors on the investment treaties on the rise, particularly including their obligation relating to the human right of the host state people who may be affected by the investment treaties. However, the relationship between investment law and human right is a recent phenomenon 
that is gaining increased attention from both the proponent and opponent of the investment treaty regime, as well as the scholars in the international investment law. As we just mentioned, some recent treaties make clear reference to human rights norms or the notion of corporate social responsibility. The limited, but I would say rich scholarship on this issue reveals that different parties involved in the investment arbitration process refers to human rights jurisprudence for various reasons. To be precise, Clement investors refers to human rights jurisprudence to advance their investment treaty claims, while respondent states invoke their human rights obligation to justify any violation of investment obligations. More importantly, arbitral tribunal have referred to human rights jurisprudence to clarify or perhaps uh, interpret the disputed investment treatment standards, mainly the indirect expropriation. Of course, scholars hold different views regarding the integration of human rights into the investment treaties, but most of them observe that investment tribunal favors human rights claims advanced by investors than those claims advanced by the host states, probably as defenses or counterclaims. Against this backdrop, let me focus on Sri Lanka's interaction with the current investment treaty regime. Sri Lanka has fully uh, embraced the notion of international investment agreement even before the commencement of the country's economic liberalization program in 1979. Needless to say, it is the first ever country challenged by a foreign investor under a dispute settlement clause in a bilateral investment treaty in the famous case of AAPL versus Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka's current web of investment treaties contain nearly 30 bilateral investment treaties and one chapter on investment in, included in the recently concluded Singapore-Sri Lanka free trade agreement. Most Sri Lanka's bilateral investment treaties concluded in 1980s following the predominant North-South uh, bilateral investment treaty template with the pro-investor orientation. As such, Sri Lanka's bilateral investment treaties generally make no reference to state right to regulate in the public interest or the non-investment policy concerns, including human right obligation of foreign investors towards the local community. Concerning the change in taking place in the investment treaty regime, Sri Lanka has been adopting a wait and see approach. Country has not seen supporting to reject the investment treaty regime in its entirety, uh, understandably because investment treaties are being considered as an essential element of Sri Lanka's investment policy. Sri Lanka's draft model bit in ninth of uh, 1813 and the recently concluded investment chapter in the Sri Lanka-Singapore Free Trade Agreement indicate that the country's willingness to adopt more balanced investment treaties in the future. Therefore, I believe that time has tried for Sri Lanka to reconsider her conventional approach towards the investment treaty regime. Sri Lanka's existing with, with or bilateral investment treaties are old-fashioned or outdated treaties that provide foreign investors with the greatest possible protection and international law. This matters because there is a gradual increase in the investment treaty claims against Sri Lanka, a fact which has been expounded as Sri Lanka has become a victim of the ISDS mechanism. Although I do not fully agree with this explanation, I predict more and more investment disputes in the future due to several reasons. To mention a few, the increased grassroots activism in Sri Lanka has strongly opposed some of the recent development projects driven by both local and foreign investors questioning their sustainability as well as the suitability. Some of these public outcry matured into intense political debates and later on into high profile lawsuits or legal actions that challenge leading investment projects such as the Colombo Port City Project as a violation of citizens' constitutionally guaranteed fundamental rights. More importantly, Sri Lanka has now become vulnerable to the emergent power rivalry in the Indian Ocean region. Of course, this is because of the country's strategic position in the Indian Ocean. Thus, having a strategic foothold in Sri Lanka, where critical infrastructure projects such as airports and seaports has become more appealing to competing regional and global superpowers, giving rise to the obvious investment law in, in investment war in Sri Lanka. Indeed, 
This scenario underscores the significance of Sri Lanka maintaining a sufficient regulatory or the policy space to regulate investment activities that may affect the country's national security and inter uh, national interest at large. In that light, I perceive Sri Lanka's existing bilateral investment treaties as a challenge to achieve sustainable and inclusive development due to their pro-investor orientation as well as their impact on the country's regulatory space. Therefore, Sri Lanka should seriously reconsider her conventional approach towards the investment treaties, especially avoiding signing such treaties as an expression of diplomatic goodwill. The country should embark on reform agenda only after deciding whether Sri Lanka want to remain in the investment treaty regime or whether the country want to leave the regime in its entirety while bringing the whole notion of protection of investment protection under the country's domestic legal purview. In my opinion, the best option available for Sri Lanka is to mutually terminate. I again highlight the point, the mutually termination of her outdated bids in order to replace them with modern by balanced investment treaties that maintains adequate policy space and incorporating non-investment policy concerns. Concerning the foreign investors obligation, the country should continue with the approach taken in the Singapore-Sri Lanka free trade agreement which reaffirmed the significance of home state encouraging their foreign investors to comply with internationally recognized uh, CSR or the corporate social responsibility principles. Perhaps the incorporation of CSR would underscore the necessity of foreign investors complying with the human rights norms in their transnational operations. If Sri Lanka wished to make an overt reference to human rights in its future uh, investment agreements, I believe that countries should do so to make the local community visible, particularly in settling investment dispute, making foreign investors obliged to respect human rights of the Sri Lankan people who have already affected by investment activities. With these thoughts, I conclude my presentation. We can have more discussion later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Delini. Again, uh, highlighting the evolution, uh, and most of the time, the evolution is something that you are pleading for, right? Uh, because most of these are old investment agreements, and I think uh, your fear is that they might become more and more problematic for Sri Lanka going forward, because communities may not be happy or satisfied with some of the development projects. And I think you mentioned very interesting phenomena in your one of the slides, investment war. Yes. So that, that is a very interesting concept that you highlight and, and probably we can go into that a little bit later. So uh, thank you very much uh, for alluding to those particular uh, nuanced you, uh, situation in Sri Lanka. Uh, now let me move on to the next panelist. Uh, and the next panelist is, is going to look at uh, Nepal as a jurisdiction from uh, South Asia. So I would like to invite Anish. So Anish, uh, in comparison to Prabhash and Dilini, you are a lawyer uh, and I understand you advise also investors, some of the foreign investors as well, your law firm. So what is your experience of uh, the investment agreements and the protection in Nepal and uh, how these investors behave when they are uh, implementing those development projects in Nepal? What are the challenges they face? And uh, what is your experience in terms of discussions in Nepal in terms of some communities that they should also have some kind of a remedy before uh, ISDS? So what is your take on those questions? So you have the floor now, Anish, thank you. Thank you, Professor Surya. Uh, I would first try to answer this from the statutory framework that uh, Nepal has. Uh, you know, in general, the statutory framework of Nepal uh, is applicable to foreign investors, you know, so that that uh, is there to ensure that human rights responsibilities are, are protected or are acknowledged when completing investment related projects. All business, uh, including foreign investment uh, projects or businesses, depending on the nature of industry, are required to conduct environmental impact assessment, initial environment examination, summary environment examination in accordance with the nature of the uh, industry. Uh, 
according to the provisions of Environment Protection Act, Environment Protection Regulation, and in, in, Industrial Enterprises Act. So this is basically to ensure the uh, you know, protection or the balance between right to environment of local community and also right to development of the citizens. So one of those projects which strikes the need and balance of development and right to environment are as such uh, promoted, you know, or permitted for the construction or operation. For example, uh, you know, a foreign investment project with a high, uh, which is willing to operate a hydropower company uh, is required to prepare a detailed project report complete EIA, provide substitute land equivalent to the land that is used for uh, power plant generation and you know, plant trees in such land. Moreover, such companies are also required to issue 10%, at least 10% of the uh, shares of the company to local public. So this is essentially to balance uh, you know, right to environment and right to development of the local, local community. Uh, likewise, businesses are also uh, required to complete a uh, labor audit, which we, we, uh, which we have acknowledged and understood from human rights due diligence perspective and is also understood as one of the pillars of UNGP's corporate responsibility of the uh, investors or businesses. You know, uh, from that perspective also, if we look at the framework that's available, investors are required to undertake labor audit um, which, which is essentially a compliance form which, in which investors are required to uh, declare uh, you know, matters not related to number of hours employees work, occupational safety, remuneration, benefits, collective bargaining, organizational grievance handling, and so on. So this is uh, done every, every, in every fiscal year. You know, after the end of every uh, fiscal year, within six months, such businesses are required uh, to submit the details to labor office. So this is not only for local business, but also for foreign investors. And this is um, greatly in watch for, for, for the foreign investors, uh, because you know if such details are not submitted, the authorized representative of investors would not be entitled to get business visas and you know, renew business visa. So this, this as an essential part of human rights due diligence, which UNGP has, has been, you know, uh, has, we, we have understood uh, the, as, as one of the pillars of UNGP. Um, so additionally, business are also required to prepare policies on health and occupational safety, overtime policies, uh, dispute and grievance handling settlement with, with an indicators. So labor audit policies on health and occupational safety, as I as I stated earlier, is, can be taken into consideration from the aspect of uh, human rights due diligence, the core element of corporate responsibility of human rights, uh, corporate responsibility to protect human rights, and one of the three pillars of UNGPs. Uh, likewise, uh, Industrial Enterprises Act, as, as, as uh, Professor Pravas in Indian context correctly stated that, uh, you know, uh, industries are required to um, you know, undertake corporate social responsibility. So, so in our context as well, Industrial Enterprises Act sets out the uh, requirement of corporate social uh, responsibility. But there is an annual threshold of turnover of 150 million rupees, and 1% of, of such turnover has to be used for uh, corporate social responsibility. And these corporate social responsibility has to be used in accordance with the plan of action that is submitted to Department of Industry. And this amount is generally used for natural disaster pre uh, prevention, scholarship, and right to education for community schools, university, pollution control, and rest. So apart from this, you know, there are other mechanisms that are also available to, to ensure that uh, you know, human rights responsibilities are protected, by, I mean, that are acknowledged and uh, and, and, and accepted by foreign investors. Those are uh, Consumer Protection Act, Solid West Act, Water Resources and Forest Act. Uh, having said that, some of the major concerns in relation to foreign investment and abuse of human rights uh, by foreign investors relates to pollution, degradation of environment, uh, right of local employment of local community uh, and so on. Particularly, uh, I would like to give you some example. Uh, you know, Nepal is quite quite a lucrative uh, country in re in relation to hydropower projects, and uh, most of the foreign investors have been investing in Nepal uh, in hydropower projects. So there is a concern of local indigenous peoples' right to fish and also right to what uh, irrigation due to you know the, the water is uh, diverted for the purpose of hydroelectricity generation and uh, some part of the river. There's no water at all. So such 
so the people of that community are not able to face or also you know are not able to use the water for irrigation purposes <clears throat> so the other concern is about uh, you know uh, environment pollution so one of the classic example of this is you know water waste from one of the biggest brewery companies of the world with foreign investment in nepal which which uh, which which contain water polluting compo components beyond permissible uh, denominator in nepal this these kind of issues uh, from a foreign investor perspective has continued to remain dispute uh, uh, con continue to remain in dispute despite the commitments uh, by foreign investors and state to oblige with uh, human rights obligation. However, the positive aspect, uh, if we see from this uh, compared to other jurisdictions, is that the regulatory framework has uh, in some way obliged foreign investors to integrate with human rights responsibilities. Greater success is seen in, in terms of, uh, in the, from the perspective of compliance of labor legislation or you know, uh, uh, labor rights. However, mixed in terms of environment protection and uh, uh, rights of local communities. In relation to your second, second part of the question, uh, you know, as our poll also correctly said, you know, that uh, if, whether human rights should be integrated in, human rights obligations should be integrated in, um, investment BIT or you know investment agreements I also uh, agree that you know uh, you know states should also make a mechanism for look uh, or for a local community to be part of ISDS but you know this is an ideal ideal situation however from a, from Nepal's perspective you know Nepal has signed total of six bilateral investment treaties out of which only four four are in force so and uh, you know in recent times, Nepal has uh, seen a great inflow of, of foreign investment in development and other projects from India and China. Uh, for example, investors from China recently in this fiscal year has committed around 1.9 billion uh, rupee out of total 2.6 billion for uh, foreign investment to be uh, in Nepal. But we, we Nepal is yet to sign for uh, you know bilateral investment treaty with China or you know, it is yet to sign bilateral investment. Although it had signed with India, it was not enforced. So it is yet to, to sign another uh, bilateral investment treaty with India and to enforce it. So what I mean to say is here, you know, our situation is quite a different one in, in, in context of implementing investment treaties. We have only four investment treaties and out of those, I mean, among those four investment treaties, as Professor uh, Pravas rightly stated, you know, this this is more of a conventional treaty. It is the first generation treaty. Uh, the approach is taken as a first generation approach. You know, uh, the rights and obligations are in protection of human rights and protection of environment mechanisms are not in, instituted in in those uh, those treaties. So. First is that BIT framework is quite conventional, so it is not possible for communities to use ISDS uh, as such as, as of now to help hold investors accountable for HR abuses. And second is that you know the 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 one we have we have to replace with the new one, and uh, Nepal needs to incorporate issues right protection of human rights, labor, and environment in order to enable communities to use ISDS to hold investors accountable for HR abuses. Um, so that's that's my presentation. Um, uh, we can discuss it further uh, later when we have a, a discussion session. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, Anish. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, probably Dori, you can, you can uh, do the second poll as well. Uh, in the meantime, I will introduce uh, the, the last speaker. Uh, so I think Anish, uh, from your presentation, uh, two things that I would like to, uh, and I think that, that also triggers a question in my mind, and, and probably I would like uh, Jörg, Delini, and Prabhash to react to that question later on, because Nepal, you highlighted, has only three operative bilateral investment agreements and no investment agreement with China, but China is investing in such a large number, right? So then the question that I have for you, all the panelists, is that do we really need investment agreements? And I think those, uh, Situations are also emerging elsewhere where countries are able to attract significant amount of investment despite not having an investment agreement. So I think this is a bit beyond the scope of this session, but I think why, why don't we discuss uh, if you are, would like to reflect on that question as well. So uh, participants and panelists, uh, there is the second question that we have. Uh, please feel free to uh, participate in this poll question and we'll share the result as we did uh, before. But let me now bring in the last, but not least, uh, the final speaker, Senia.
So Sanya, if you can uh, allude to us, because you represent uh, a network uh, of civil society organizations uh, representing the views from the global south in particular, uh, including on investment agreements and trade agreements. So in your view, the progress that we have seen in the last one decade, is that good enough? Is it reflective of the expectations from the communities in relation to human rights and sustainable development? Or what else would you like to see going forward? In particular, the, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on uh, the investment agreements as such. And I think Jorg also highlighted that issue. So any reflections on that will also be uh, useful. So you have the floor, Senya. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for including me. I actually wanted to start with your previous question um, about why have these investment treaties, you know, do they attract foreign direct investment? Because if they don't have these kinds of benefits, but they do have costs, then why should governments continue to sign them? Or yeah, please, feel free to start with that. <laughs> So uh, many governments, I think, signed these bilateral investment treaties because they thought that it would attract foreign direct investment. But there have been a number of studies, including by UNCTAD, the World Bank, the Australian government, who found that the results don't support this. That even when you sign, you know, 100 bilateral investment treaties, you don't necessarily get more foreign direct investment. Um, and there's been surveys of government officials, investors, risk insurers, risk rating agencies to see if they check whether there's a bilateral investment treaty and they generally they do not before deciding whether to invest or give a risk rating or provide political risk insurance. And we know that a number of countries who have withdrawn from their bilateral investment treaties have not suffered a fall in foreign direct investment. In fact, Bolivia's foreign direct investment increased after it withdrew from bilateral investment treaties. So it's not clear to me that the benefits are there um, that governments thought they would get when they signed these treaties. On the other hand, um, these investment treaties or free trade agreement investment chapters have generated more than 1,000 known cases where foreign investors have sued governments at an international tribunal um, via this investor to state dispute settlement or ISDS. And governments have had to pay investors more than 1 billion US dollars in each case in more than in 13 known cases. So for example, famously Pakistan lost a case about a mine and they were ordered to pay the foreign investor 5.9 billion US dollars just after it had received an international monetary fund loan for 6 billion US dollars. So basically they had to give the entire loan to the foreign investor. India of course recently lost a case um, a tax ISDS case with Ken Group, and they've been ordered to pay 1.4 billion US dollars during this pandemic. So the Indian government may have to give oil fields to the foreign investor instead. And of course, foreign investors have used this ISDS mechanism in these treaties to successfully challenge a range of um, measures that have human rights implications, including a ban on dangerous chemicals, which um, the Canadian government banned for health and environment reasons. Um, the investor won, Canada settled, reversed the ban. Um, governments who have not allowed quarries or toxic waste dumps for environmental reasons have been successfully challenged by foreign investors. Governments who stopped the export of hazardous waste to check the compliance with environmental treaties like the Basel Convention have been successfully challenged by foreign investors under these treaties. Governments who imposed, the German government imposed environmental requirements on coal-fired power stations, settled and withdrew a lot of the measures. Uh, again, when the German government failed, phased out nuclear power post the Fukushima nuclear disaster, they had to settle and pay the foreign investors. Um, investors who raised the water price by 70% and made it unaffordable when the uh, Argentine government responded by trying to stop the water being cut off when their citizens couldn't pay for it, the investor sued and won. When governments don't allow water rates to be raised to ensure that it's affordable, as in the case of another Argentinian case in the Dominican Republic for electricity rates, again the investors sued and won and in one of those cases it was two weeks after the treaty came into force that the investor sued. Um, investors have also, of course, brought cases to challenge tobacco control measures, increases in the minimum wage, moratoriums on fracking, um, requirements to pay a fine when they pollute the forest and poison indigenous groups. Um, and of course, when the uh, Peruvian government didn't give a third extension to an investor whose smelter caused so much pollution that 99% of the children had lead poisoning and the cadmium rates were more than 40 times what the World Health Organization recommended, because the Peruvian government didn't give the investor a third extension to clean up, they were sued. The government won, but the investor is now suing them again. Other governments like the Canadian government have been chilled from taking measures like tobacco control measures by the mere threat of an ISDS case. And as Jörg noticed, COVID uh, noted, 
COVID measures can be challenged under ISDS. So um, Chile has been sued under ISDS for its COVID measures, um, even though legally it could not give the assistance to the foreign investor that the investor wanted um, due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the government measures to deal with that on the foreign investor's profits. So um, given the various ways in which COVID-19 measures could be threatened by ISDS cases under these treaties, various United Nations special rapporteurs um, on human rights and the former president of United Nations General Assembly have called for no ISDS claims to be happening about the pandemic measures and no ISDS cases, including about any measure, say mining or taxation, to be taking place during the pandemic. Nevertheless, ISDS cases are occurring about pandemic measures and about other things. They are still continuing and investors are still um, asking to be paid during the pandemic when we know government budgets are very tightly stretched, dealing with the pandemic, buying vaccines, supporting their um, citizens and so on. So 659 civil society organisations from around the world called for a suspension of all ISDS cases during the pandemic, um, no payment of ISDS awards during the pandemic and not to negotiate, sign or ratify investment treaties with ISDS and to terminate those that exist. Um, so what can be done? Um, as you heard from earlier speakers, India's new model bilateral investment treaty has some exceptions. For example, um, measures taken by local governments, taxation measures and public services. Um, the Australia, U uh, Australian Free Trade Agreement investment chapters with Indonesia and Peru and so on have an exception to ISDS for health measures, but not say for environment. Some bilateral investment treaties have no ISDS, for example, Brazil's new ones, um, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement investment chapter at the moment. Um, and some countries like Slovakia, after it was sued a number of times in ISDS cases, has added some safeguards to its bilateral investment treaties, which you can see, for example, with Iran, where the treaty only applies to investment made and maintained in accordance with the host government's laws, which could include human rights laws or environment laws. And that treaty says no ISDS claims are possible if the host government's law has been violated and the host government can bring counterclaims that, for example, the foreign investor violated the host country law. Um, however, some governments who have tried to restrict some of the problematic provisions in these investment treaties, such as fair and equitable treatment through an annex narrowing it, um, the ISDS tribunals have ignored it in two out of two cases under that treaty. Other governments tried to include exceptions like tax, but again, the ISDS tribunal ignored it. And so there have also been, of course, famous conflict of interest problems in these um, ISGS tribunals where one of the arbitrators was on the board of directors of the biggest shareholder of the investor bringing the case. She did not disclose this. She did not recuse herself. The investor won. When the government found out and tried to appeal and get the award annulled, the ISDS tribunal refused and um, said the investor still wins. So, of course, governments can try to add human rights obligations to these investment treaties, but it's not clear that it would be successful given the way that these ISDS tribunals like to broadly interpret their jurisdiction and refuse to take account of exceptions in existing IAAs. So we saw from your slides that um, governments often lose or settle these ISDS cases where you know they have to give the investor something like reverse the measure that the investor didn't like. And even when governments win, one study found that they still have to pay their own costs in 70% of the cases. So however, when investors win, they only have to cover their own costs in 40% of the cases. And then even when the government wins and the tribunal orders the investor to pay the government's legal fees, which was $12 million for El Salvador in one case, the tribunal only ordered $8 million of that to be covered and the investor refused to pay any of it. So even when governments win and those rare cases where the uh, tribunal says, investor, please pay the government's legal fees, you know, the lawyers can be $1,000 an hour, still the governments are often not covered for the, the money they've spent in defending these cases. So after these problematic um, ISDS cases, and given that these treaties are not proven to attract foreign direct investment, a number of governments have been withdrawing from them, including India, Indonesia, the European Union for intra-EU investment treaties, Bolivia, Venezuela, South Africa. And uh, South Africa did so after an investor challenged the South African government's affirmative action for black South Africans that it put in place after the end of apartheid. Um, so that was obviously a very serious um, government policy and measure that was challenged by the investor. So, of course, uh, CSOs can try and get human rights into other mechanisms, for example, through the legally binding instrument on business and human rights that is currently being negotiated. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions and I'll put the links to some further information in the chat. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Sanya, for uh, taking on several uh, dimensions of this uh, broad issue that uh, you picked up. So, uh, uh, Dori, if you can share the uh, <laughs> the poll result, uh, that is for all of you to see. Again, I think uh, it is uh, quite one-sided outcome, it seems. Uh, and uh, now I would like to bring all the speakers together. So, Dori, if you could, uh, perhaps uh, spotlight all the speakers together. And I'm going to invite them for some discussion and questions. So if there are some uh, participants who have questions, uh, you're most welcome to reflect those questions to us. Uh, put this in the q and I'm going to pick it up from there. Otherwise, I have some questions and probably uh, the panelists may have some reflections or comments based on what others fe fellow panelists mentioned. So let me start with uh, Jorg and Prabhash. Uh, uh, do, you, do you agree with uh, the stand taken by Sanya that these investment agreements don't really attract investment, so they are basically useless? Or it is, it is a more uh, nuanced thing that investment requires a number of variables, and these agreements is only one of the variables rather than the variable. So I think that is, that is something I would like to pose. Uh, the, the other question on which I would like your reflection is, is about communities. Where do communities come into these? Like investors are third parties, right? So here we have two states negotiating this agreement. Investors are third parties. In, in a strict contract sense, they're outsiders to the contract. Communities are similarly outsiders, third parties, right? So where do you see communities? Should the states be consulting them before signing those investment agreements? Should the states be consulting before allowing investors to invest in development projects? You know, so so one question is of course about the substance, what you put inside those agreements. But there's also a question about the process of negotiation and the lack of transparency in negotiation. Let, let us take uh, not not an example from South Asia, but let us take uh, EU-China investment agreement. I mean, the agreement was announced, but the text of the agreement was not available until quite late. And I think it was released in parts, in fact. You know, so there's a lot of these issues about lack of transparency in negotiations. So, so these are big questions, uh, but I would like to invite you to provide some reflections. Your, uh, can, can we start with you, please? Thank you. And then Prabhash after that. Thank you. Successfully unmuted, sure. Thank you very much and uh, uh, thanks for the question. I, I greatly appreciate and uh, enjoy listening to Sanya. Uh, we have been on, on, on panels uh, uh, like this uh, many times and uh, we know uh, the arguments. I, I like her, her very uh, uh, passionate summary of what's wrong with IIAs and what's wrong with ISDS and uh, uh, we all uh, um, uh, cannot but just agree with her in, in, in general terms, in terms of the, of the examples she cited, which all are real and which all are uh, to a great degree scandalous. However, we have to, uh, when we look at the issue of IRA, step a little bit back and see why we are in the process of uh, dealing with this matter. Apart from that we need to deal with this matter because lawyers apparently take a great deal of advantage of it and some people call it in the meantime an arbitration industry which takes advantage of these issues in which uh, it makes it very difficult uh, to, to pursue reform as some as some are. Why are we dealing with IRAs? Why are we doing with IRAs? Number one, they exist and as we've learned, uh, uh, there exist quite a number of them and quite an enormous number of them, namely 2,500. And besides that, we can see a certain reform momentum uh, when it comes also to the numbers, mostly because the, of the European Union's uh, uh, need to deal with the intra-EU uh, uh, bids and with the external EU bids in, in light of the AMEA uh, uh, jurisdiction by the uh, European Court of Justice. There are uh, still uh, more than uh, 1,600 in force agreement around the world which uh, represent the stock of all treaties which needs reform. Now, why do countries not only uh, reform by just terminating as some have done? Why? Besides of all these uh, problems uh, and, and some of these scandalous outcomes of investor state dispute settlement uh, proceedings, why do most countries uh, not embark on 
uh, simply going ahead and terminating them. They do not embark on that. They do not simply terminate because for them, investment agreements are part and parcel of the arsenal of investment promotion. Now, uh, there has, and Sonia mentioned it, some studies, uh, actually there have been quite a number of econometric studies trying to establish a link between BITs and investment inflows. And uh, um, it's, it's, it's uh, not as one-sided as uh, um, um, it's been portrayed at one point in time, but it's very difficult to establish a link between these two. Precisely because not one bit is like the other, precisely because investment promotion provisions are not existing and some other, other reasons why there is no direct, why there can be no direct link meant. Not being able to establish a direct link, does that mean that IRAs do not serve any purpose? Obviously not, because uh, uh, they do serve as a certain reinsurance uh, factor for investors to uh, embark on investing in uh, jurisdictions which are not their own. Now, is this needed? And I think there, again, we need to step back. We talked about COVID, we talked about the pandemic, we talked about the economic impact. And we know that the economic impact of the measures taken to deal with the pandemic are more severe and will be more harshly felt in uh, the majority of the countries around the world, namely the developing countries who do not have the financial means as uh, some other countries have to provide uh, 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 stimulus packages to safe companies to provide a, a furloughing for, for unemployed people, et cetera. And for these countries, for most of these countries, we are dealing with a triple, quadruple blow. Number one, um, remittances uh, uh, payments have has nosedived. Number two, uh, official development assistance is uh, uh, certainly not accelerating, certainly not growing, and it's uh, not only stagnating, but there seems to be a, a slow decline. Number three, trade flows are under, under grave, grave pressure. Number four, foreign direct investment itself has now started by 50 to 60% in developing countries. Uh, number five, uh, the issue of uh, debt relief is not making the necessary uh, 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 progress. Uh, we're talking about suspension of debt servicing, but there is no debt forgiveness inside and, and uh, there is no uh, breakthrough to be seen even in the G20 on these issues for the foreseeable future. And number six, uh, public and bilateral lending also stalls. At one point in time, countries will need to look for the development finance needed to overcome the uh, adverse effects of the pandemic. And that's where uh, foreign direct investment, despite of being on the decline, will, will come back to the fore. And many countries will once again engage in a very clear and proactive investment promotion to get foreign capital into their economies to get the economy going again and overcome the shock of the pandemic. Why I am elaborating all of this precisely because for many countries, international investment agreements are part and parcel of this arsenal and we need to help them to make best use of this arsenal short of uh, 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 putting it away and terminating it. And there, indeed, we come in and say, listen, uh, everybody agrees that uh, the pre-2010 uh, agreements have given rise to some scandalous findings of uh, arbitral tribunals and countries would be best advised to indeed engage in reforming their existing stock of IRAs. For example, if you look at the existing stock of the IRAs of Nepal, uh, they all predate 2010 and they're all drafted in such manner that indeed uh, arbitral firms would find the feast in, in terms of uh, allowing for vast interpretations not originally intended by the party. So there is a clear need to engage in IRA reform and making the old outdated treaties work for development in the sense that we need to modernize them. And part and parcel of this modernization drive, as I said, and the accelerator needs to start with core IRA provisions making sure that they are being updated and reformed in such manner that they're sacrosanct vis-a-vis -vis arbitral uh, interpretations. And then indeed, there are other areas which one can expand to. And one of this area is indeed the question of how does one reflect human rights provisions. And there I found it very interesting to hear, of course, um, what India is doing. Uh, uh, and I found it very interesting to, to hear that indeed India has uh, <laughs> gone both ways without having in the own interpretation without having uh, uh, succeeded in, in finding a, an adequate and balanced approach. And I think that's what we could discuss, what constitutes a balanced approach. The UNCTAD Investment Policy Framework provides a couple of areas uh, and ideas on how human rights could be reflected in investment treaties. And I'd be happy to uh, go down the road of elaborating on that 
further on. But with that, I leave it for the time being and pass the floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jörg, for those reflections. Uh, now I would like to invite Prabhash back. Uh, so Prabhash, any reflections that you have uh, in response to the comments that the fellow, fellow panelists made or the questions that I asked Jörg? Uh, one additional question that, that may deserve consideration is that uh, when we talk about reforming the existing uh, bilateral investment agreements, we talk about ideal situation of a mutual termination or uh, both states agreeing mutually to replace it with, with a more uh, balanced investment agreement. But what if the other side does not agree on that? So, because there's a possibility the other state may not agree. So, so any suggestions, uh, let us say India wants to mutually upgrade or Nepal wants to mutually upgrade its old investment agreement, but those partner states don't wish to go for this mutual uh, updation, updation, right? Updating. So, any reflections on that? Uh, you have the floor, Prabhash. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Surya. Before I answer this question, a few reflections on what Sanya mentioned. Uh, I share the concerns that she she expressed, uh, but I think that they are slightly exaggerated. Uh, I mean, if one cannot say conclusively that investment treaties attract foreign investment one also cannot say conclusively that investment treaties do not attract foreign investment. I guess the reality is, uh, is more nuanced. While there are studies which show that investment treaties have not played uh, a role in attracting investment, there are also studies which show that in certain conditions, in certain countries, investment treaties have played a role in attracting investment. So it is not an either or question. And you know it's, it's, an, it's an oversimplification to say that since they have no bearing on attracting investment and therefore we don't need them. Uh, this is from the economic point of view, from, you know, from an international rule of law point of view, uh, investment treaties are an important instrument available to hold arbitrary state, uh, to hold uh, uh, accountable arbitrary state action. Uh, Sanya mentioned about the Kane Energy case uh, and uh, you know, the, the concern that India has been asked to pay a lot of, a lot of money as damages. Uh, but I would ask a more fundamental question. Why did this case arise in the first place? This case arose in the first place because India amended its tax laws retrospectively, making saying that these, these tax laws retrospectively stand from 1961, overruling the decision of its own uh, Supreme Court uh, because, it, it, because the government acted like a bad loser and didn't want to give up on that revenue. Now, uh, if, that, if that law had not been amended retrospectively, uh, then this case would not have arisen, neither the Kane case nor the Vodafone case. And as I have argued in my book, especially in context of India, uh, a very large number of these ISDS claims against India would not have arisen if India had been little more diligent in its regulatory action. So if there is bad regulatory behavior by the state, then I think the state deserves to be sued before an ISDS tribunal. Uh, but this does not mean that I'm saying that everything is well with the ISDS system and there are no issues. Of course, there are issues. There, are, uh, there have been bad awards. There have been awards where exorbitant damages have been awarded. Uh, uh, there, but there have also been awards where arbitration tribunals have upheld the sovereign uh, right to regulate of the state. Uh, so the system definitely needs, needs reform. Uh, the ISDS system, you know, you talked about transparency, Surya. The transparency is not just in the negotiation process, but also in the ISDS mechanism, uh, that there should be a greater transparency in how the ISDS functions, who are the arbitrators, how do they get appointed, so on and so forth. Uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, while I share the concerns, but I would not throw the baby out with the bathwater because then we are basically saying that if we, if we live in a world where there are no investment treaties, then it basically means that states can't be held accountable uh, for arbitrary state action under international law. The, the, the counter to this often is that, well, states can be held accountable in their domestic courts. But then we, we know very well that judiciary in many of these countries is not independent. Even in countries where it is said that judiciary is independent constitutionally, we have observed that whenever we have a very strong, powerful political executive, the judiciary often succumbs. We have seen this in India. We have seen this in several countries. And therefore, uh, it's, 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 it's an oversimplification to say that, well, you can always go before the domestic courts. The, the, the domestic courts might not function uh, in, in, in truly independent fashion, especially when you have a very strong populist, uh, muscular uh, government, uh, government in office. 
Uh, and lastly, Surya, to, to respond to your point about the, what role the communities can play, uh, I think it's a very fascinating question because, uh, as you rightly say, that uh, uh, investment treaties create rights for foreign investors and foreign investors are, are strictly speaking third parties. Likewise, I mean, one can argue hypothetically that investment treaties can also create rights for communities. Uh, and communities can also be third parties and, and, and I don't know, I'm just sort of throwing this uh, for discussion and maybe greater reflection that communities may be given the, given the, given the uh, right to challenge uh, foreign investors before, before an arbitral forum uh, if foreign investors do not implement the binding obligations imposed on them. Or if that would be too revolutionary, then maybe the other thing is, as I said in my presentation, that there should be binding obligations on the foreign investor, uh, and the host state should be uh, should be allowed to hold them accountable. But in that process, if say if say the host state brings a claim against the investor for causing environmental degradation or for abusing human rights, then the host state should should be able to take the communities affected on board. It should be able to take into account the views of the communities affected on board uh, and make them a party in that particular dispute. And that could be one way by which we can, uh, while, at, while on the one hand, we can preserve the international law mechanism of the state responding to the investor's claim. But, the, but, but on the other hand, we, we are also providing an institutionalized platform for communities to participate in the dispute resolution mechanism. So this could be a way forward uh, and, and, and states should be willing to do this. So I think that you know, if we, if we take a long time horizon, we can see that there are reforms which have taken place. I mean, if we, if we go back in time to 2010 to 2005, the kind of investment treaties that existed then and the kind of investment treaties that exist today, uh, the kind of uh, 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 peer pressure which is now brought on the functioning of ISDS mechanism. Uh, so reforms have taken place. Uh, the investor obligations, although in soft form, or, or in, in a best endeavor clause are at least now available in the investment treaties. And now it's time to move to the next phase where we make these uh, binding on the foreign investor. Uh, but but in, in my, sub my last submission would be that we need to constructively engage with the system rather than critique the system to the point of getting rid of it because then, uh, uh, then I think we would throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'll end with this proverbial thought, thank you. Thank, thanks, Prabash. Uh, I understand Sania would like to uh, add something and probably respond. Uh, but before I go to Sania, probably I will also bring in uh, Delini here. So Delini, if you want to uh, uh, respond to any of the comments uh, or suggestions made by the previous panelists, but also I would like to throw in one more point in terms of the imbalance, right? So even if we have the rights, uh, sorry, obligations imposed on investors under these agreements, how are we going to enforce those obligations? Because if the courts are not independent for investors, as Prabhas mentioned, let us take this point, right? But if they are not independent for investors, we cannot assume that they are going to be independent for these communities who are so powerless, even if they are from the same country. How can those communities get justice before the same courts if they are unreliable for these foreign investors who have more power, right? than the communities. So I think that issue of imbalance is very much inherent. So any ideas you have to address this issue of imbalance between the investors and the communities? And sometimes uh, my experience is that uh, if the governments cannot be trusted by investors, these governments are also not trustable by their own communities. So, so I think this lack of trust on the part of the governments, what they do is, is a double-edged sword, right? So uh, with those, uh, I invite you, Delini, and after that, Sanya, you will have the floor. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Shorya. And uh, if I reflect upon the first comment, uh, whether we do we really need the IIS to attract foreign investment? Just start with that point. So I think uh, it depends upon the context. For example, when it's concerned, if I bring the Sri Lankan perspective, in Sri Lanka, there has been no any comprehensive studies has been done to ensure that or to clarify whether the sign, there is a link between the signing of bilateral investment treaties and the inflow of the foreign investment into the country. But at the policy level, there has been an presumption or acceptance that uh, it is 
important for us to have these kind of treaties to attract foreign investments because I, um, uh, in, in the Sri Lankan constitution, there is a very specific provisions in the article 157, which says that if a foreign investment agreement is approved by the parliament, by the two third majority, it become a internal law of Sri Lanka against which no any legislative, administrative or executive uh, action can be taken except national security. I think it's it's a, such a great um, legal protection or acknowledgement given by the Sri Lanka's constitution to the foreign investment agreement. So once there was a discussion on uh, approving some bilateral investment treaties under this section, uh, one of the former foreign min, uh, financial ministers said in the House of the Parliament said that we need to attract, uh, because we need to sign or ratify these foreign uh, agreements in order to attract more foreign investors, because he showed some statistics to show that Sri Lanka attract more foreign investment from Australia after signing and ratifying the bilateral investment treaty with the Australia. At the same time, there is one um, uh, research which has been done by the one of the high official from Sri Lanka's BOI or the Board, in, Board of Investment, which promotes Sri Lanka as a destination for foreign investment. And they also have a statistic to show that Sri Lanka has attracted much foreign investment from the countries uh, with which country has bilateral investment treaties rather than the countries with the country don't have uh, bilateral investment treaty. So I think it depends upon the context. So it, if, if uh, we cannot give an abstract idea that uh, whether they have a link or there is no link between the attraction of foreign investment and signing uh, bilateral investment treaties, it, it's contextualized. At the same time, when it comes to my own opinion, is not having a foreign uh, agreement is uh, it, it's whether having or not is not important because the content also very important because when I see that the China and Sri Lanka has a bilateral investment treaties which has been signed in 1987 which is uh, chronologically belong to the first generation I thought that wow the Chinese investment is going to get a huge protection the greatest possible protection on international law for their Chinese investment in Sri Lanka but I dig deep into the context I said that it is it's not it's not the case because this investment treaty, the China-Sri Lanka bilateral investment treaty has been influenced by the Chinese way of doing bilateral investment treaty at the very early stage of their investment treaty making. And it's a pro, pro I, I would say, and I argue that it's like a pro-state investment treaty because it has given so much regulatory power for the host state to regulate uh, foreign investment from the entry and during the operation. So, but despite the fact that there is a less protective bilateral China Sri Lanka bilateral investment treaty, China has become the top investor in the Sri Lanka and with a lot of uh, complicated problems. So, that is uh, one aspect I want to bring. So, I think we have to think more deeper. And uh, one, having foreign investment uh, agreement could be one reason, but uh, it, it's not going to be the conclusive. So it's a, it depends upon the context. And when it's come to the, your second uh, you point. If can be brief, um, uh, Dilini, I'm looking yeah. at the time now. So we just yeah. have six, seven minutes left yeah. and I would like to give the floor to Sania. And yes, Kobe I think when well. it comes to obligation, these kind of imbalances could be happening anywhere because we cannot say perfectly un, 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 uh, unbiased court. But when it comes to Sri Lanka's experience, I would say that court would take more towards the communities aspect because the, throughout the last decades, most of development projects, as I mentioned in the in the, my presentation, most of these foreign investment projects have been challenged as a violation of fundamental rights of the citizens. And court has been always taken the uh, Sri Lanka's people's side saying that there should be, they should ensure the sustainable development. But in that sense, I am wondering whether Sri Lanka, foreign investors in Sri Lanka could uh, agreed to go into the domestic courts because they have seen some sort of like favorable response from the court towards the citizens' fundamental right applications. That's all. Thank you, Dilini, uh, and, and thank you for also trying to conclude. Uh, Sanya, over to you, and uh, I give with you a blank check, so whatever you wish to say or respond to the previous uh, panelists. I don't pose any additional questions to you. You have the Thank you, now. sir. Yeah. 
Um, so yes, just following from the discussion about whether these uh, bilateral investment treaties attract foreign direct investment, um, I forgot to say earlier that the World Bank and other economists find that the main drivers of foreign direct investment are things like the size of the markets. That's why China and India get a lot of foreign direct investment, whether you have good infrastructure, whether you have natural resources like oil and gas, so investors will come to extract that, whether you have a, a workforce that is uh, can speak English and so on. So for example, Brazil did not have any bilateral investment treaties in force for a long time because its Congress, its parliament refused to ratify them because of the imbalance of the agreements and the impact on the government's right to regulate. But during that time, Brazil was the fifth largest recipient of foreign direct investment in the world. So um, of course, now Brazil has a new model and it doesn't have ISDS and so on. And similarly, uh, the US government under President Trump and under President Biden are against ISDS, and I can give you a link in the chat to their reasons why. The current New Zealand government is against ISDS and does not agree to it in its um, agreements. The previous Australian government was against ISDS, and I think the reason why was the minister thought that this is capitalism, so investors should sink or swim on their own. They should do their own due diligence, and if they watch the news and decide, see that that country is at war, so it's risky to invest, then don't invest. Or if they decide to invest, in a country that's at war, for example, well, then there's a high risk their investment might be destroyed, but there would be less competition, so they could charge high prices and so on. So it was not the role of the government to give this kind of insurance to companies so that win or lose, they always come out ahead. You know, heads the, the investor wins, tails the government loses, because this is not what the government does in other sectors. For example, if my house burns down, the government doesn't give me free fire insurance, right? I have to take out my own risk insurance to cover myself from fire. But what these investment treaties effectively do is ensure um, investors from these risks. So if there is no investment treaty, of course, the foreign investor still gets the protection of domestic law. And if the foreign investor thinks that domestic courts are not independent, then presumably the domestic courts should be fixed, right? Because that would also benefit communities and others. In the meantime, if the government really wants a particular investor to come in, for example, because it's greenfield investment that will bring in jobs, and that investor says, we will not invest unless you give me better protection than domestic law because I don't trust your courts, then the host government could, for example, sign an investment contract with that investor in which it has very similar provisions to those in a bilateral investment treaty, including ISDS and an international tribunal. But leaving it to investment contracts enables the government to have a tailored solution so they can decide to give that to investors who are very beneficial with greenfield, with new jobs, with technology transfer, rather than you know just some portfolio investment, hot money inflows or mergers and acquisitions, which would automatically get the protection of a broad uh, investment treaty that gives protection to a broad range of um, investments and investors. So some developing countries do it that way and they, they then tailor the protection they give the foreign investors above and beyond domestic law and domestic courts, depending on how big the benefits are for sustainable development for the country from that investment project, for example. And just lastly, on your question, Surya, about whether um, governments should consult communities before they sign um, investment treaties um, and the way that these treaties are normally negotiated in secret and the same for free trade agreement investment chapters, I put some recommendations in the chat by a number of you and special rapporteurs on this. Um, and as to your question about whether the community views should be taken into account before allowing certain investment projects to go ahead, this of course is what Canada tried to do with the quarry and the uh, Canadian government said, we take into account the views of the community, we don't allow the quarry, and therefore the Canadian government was sued by the foreign investor under ISDS and the Canadian government lost. So yes, it, it's good to take into account the views of communities, but this is exactly the reason why investors can bring cases and successfully sue governments um, under these kinds of treaties with ISDS. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Sanya, for uh, providing some different perspectives. And of course, uh, we, we can agree to disagree on some of those issues. And I think that is the whole idea of having this conversation. So, Anis, we're running out of time, but uh, if you want to quickly jump in in a couple of one or two minutes, uh, you have the last words. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure, Professor Zuria. Uh, in relation to investment agreement, from, from Nepal's experience, what I can conclude is, you know, investment agreement is not mandatory because we have had we have had uh, four investment agreements which is in effect with germany finland uk and france but these investors in in the investment uh, toll if we see they're they're far behind uh, it's india china america uh, they are the first investors in nepal so from my experience and from experience of nepal i would say you know a general protection that that might be a legislative protection for example we have foreign investment and technology transfer act which which uh, which uh, which uh, which gives national treatment, which gives most favored nation treatment, which which uh, which uh, uh, which forbids nationalization, 
and also uh, you know compensation if any nationalization uh, is is done so you know from from our perspective from nepal's perspective i would rather say if a strong legislative framework is there uh, it, it is uh, enough to attract foreign investors and also to ensure uh, human rights as such is uh, protected by foreign investors uh, when, when investment is made. Thanks. All right. So with this, uh, I will uh, conclude the session. So thank you very much once again, all the panelists for sharing your uh, reasoned and informed uh, perspectives on a number of issues. Of course, the debate will continue. Uh, beyond the session, but uh, it was wonderful to have all of you with us. I would also like to thank the participants uh, and their participation in poll questions, at least if they did not ask any questions. Uh, thank you to Dori as well for all the logistics uh, and making this as much. Uh, so bye for now, everyone. Thank you once again for joining the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Surya. Bye-bye.